Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first scientific talk of the Laura Bassi Colloquium series. While we wait for more people to join us, we will have a very short movie describing the historical figure and the scientific merits of Laura Bassi. We will start five minutes from now. During the age of enlightenment, when Galilean and Newtonian science were becoming the paradigm across universities and academies throughout to Europe, which were strictly reserved to men at the time, a woman of exceptional talent lived in Bologna, gaining recognition and influence in the scientific field. Her name was Laura Maria Caterina Bassi. Laura was born on 29 of October 1711 into a wealthy family who, recognizing the uncommon intelligence of the little girl, sought to give her a solid cultural education. In 1732, she earned a degree of doctor in philosophy from the University of Bologna, thanks also to the patronage of Cardinal Prospero Lambertini, the future Pope Benedict XIV, who admired her ability. A few months later, because of her remarkable scientific skills, the Senate of the University assigned her an honorary position at the chair of Philosophia Universa, that is, of natural philosophy. Daily public lessons were denied to her being a woman, but she became the first salaried female lecturer in the world. In the following years, the young woman continued to study. She deepened her knowledge of Newton's works under the guidance of Jacopo Bartolomeo Beccari, professor of experimental physics at the Institute of Sciences, and she learned mathematical analysis from the mathematician Gabriele Manfredi, pioneer of differential calculus in Italy. In 1738, she married Giuseppe Veratti, a doctor in medicine who shared with his wife a keen interest in the study of nature. The couple had eight children, five survived the infancy, and Laura personally nursed and raised them, at the same time continuing her studies and her scientific research. In 1745, Pope Benedict XIII admitted Laura Bassi among the elite group of scholars named Benedictine academics, but only as a supernumerary, and not without resistance. Filling this role, she had to present at least one original dissertation a year. In this way, Laura played an active role inside the Bolognese scientific community. Before performing her talks, Laura carried out several experiments with her husband in her own home, in a special laboratory that the couple had equipped with the most advanced tools and machines of the time. This laboratory was used not only for her personal research, but also for the private lessons in experimental physics that Laura Bassi held for philosophy 
and medical students of the university. These private lessons, a fairly common practice at the time, replaced the missing courses in the Archigynasio, so the Senate recognized their public utility and repeatedly granted the Laura Bassi salary increases. In this way, the problem of public lessons, which had been denied her in 1732, was also solved. The Bassi Veratti House was not only a space for research and teaching, but also a place for scientific meetings and exchanges. In addition to academics and students, Italian and foreign scholars also arrived here, including Abbot Jean Antoine Olé, Lazzaro Spallanzani, Giambattista Beccaria and Alessandro Volta. The almost 30 years of high-level lessons held by Laura at her home earned her the assignment of the position, this time effective, of Professor of Experimental Physics in the Institute of Sciences in 1776. Only two years later, on the morning of February 20, 1778, Laura Bassi died suddenly after having participated in a session of the Academy of Sciences the previous evening. This woman, a forerunner of female emancipation, remains an admirable example for all women of science still today. So good afternoon, everyone, again, for the people who just joined. We just watched a very nice movie that presented the figure of Laura Bassi. Um, and thanks to Valeria Zanini for producing it. Um, and to, of course, also our rigid, <coughs> <I'm> sorry, <coughs> our director extraordinaire, Derico. Um, now we will start with the seminar and the first speaker for the Laura Bassi colloquium series is Elisa Bortolas. It's a real honor for me to present her because she got her PhD in the same institute where I am at, so this is a privilege. She got her actually undergraduate degree at the University of Milano, then she moved to Padova where she got her PhD in 2018. Um, her PhD thesis uh, won the Graton Prize in 2019 for the best a PhD thesis in astronomy and astrophysics in Italy. And she was a postdoc um, in Zurich. Um, and then she is now actually a, a postdoc at the University of Milan working in the Cesana group. So Elisa, you can start whenever you feel uh, comfortable. Okay, thank you very much, Sara, for the nice introduction. I will now try to share my screen. Uh, okay, hopefully you can all see it. Uh, so, first of all, I would really, really like to thank the organizers of this amazing uh, seminar series, which is about the promotion of girls and women in STEM, which is something I also really care about. Uh, so, thank you very much. And also, I am very honored to be the, the first one. Uh, oh, to start this series. So uh, today I'm going to tell you something about uh, the formation and evolution of supermassive black hole binaries during the evolution of the universe and of galaxies. Uh, and in particular, uh, supermassive black hole binaries are expected uh, to form often uh, during the evolution of the universe due to the fact that galaxies basically grow in a hierarchical fashion. So they basically accrete material from the environment and they exper often experience mergers until they build up all their mass. And we also have to remember that uh, 
massive black holes uh, with masses between 10 to the 5 to even 10 to the 10 inhabit the galaxies we observe nowadays and are observed to be sometimes in place up to the onset of galaxy formation. So uh, if many galaxies hosting massive black holes merge, then a large number of those massive black hole binaries will form and find themselves within the same galaxy. And so uh, this brings basically to the motivation of uh, my work, uh, uh, which is uh, the fact that if two of uh, such uh, massive black holes find themselves at a separation that is uh, roughly of the milliparsec in the case of a 10 to the 6 solar mass binary, they are expected to reach their final coalescence uh, emitting a burst of uh, low frequency gravitational waves. And uh, this is a great news because uh, we are going to be able to observe uh, such gravitational waves. This is a great uh, time for gravitational wave astronomy. Unfortunately, low frequency gravitational waves are not accessible to the LIGO and Virgo interferometers that are currently operational. But uh, there will be other uh, missions like uh, the LISA mission and the pulsar timing array that uh, in the future will detect the the mergers of those massive black holes. And uh, I will particularly focus on the LISA mission, which is going to be launched uh, in 2030 something, and is expected to detect the merger of massive black hole binaries with masses between 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 7 ish solar masses uh, with great signal to noise in principle up to the beginning of the universe, up to very, very high redshift. And this is a great news because it means that we, we will be able to probe the hierarchical clustering of galaxies and also to understand better how massive black holes uh, formed and evolved, which is still a mystery sort of for the present day. And also we will get a lot of information about uh, the properties of massive black holes across the cosmic epochs. So if we want to make predictions for those uh, forthcoming exciting uh, observatories, so we do really need now to work on anticipating the detection rates and the properties of the future detected uh, uh, objects. And in particular, this comes down to understanding uh, how the in spiral proceeds from when two galaxies merge at a large scale down to a subparsec separation at which the two black holes finally manage to coalescence, to reach coalescence. And uh, uh, just to start, I want to mention this uh, very famous study by Begelman, Blanford and Rees in the 80s who established the, the paradigm for the evolution of massive binaries. Uh, and in particular, they suggested in the beginning, we have a dynamical friction uh, driven in spiral uh, in which massive black holes uh, sink, uh, experiencing uh, this sort of gravitational drag against uh, stars, dark matter and gas. Um, and uh, Basically, this effect, if it is efficient enough, will bring the binary down to its formation. So the two uh, black holes will form a bound system. So then if the system is dominated by stars, the binary will start shrinking by interacting with stars that get close enough to the binary. Those stars will undergo sort of a slingshot ejections, uh, meaning that they will extract energy from the binary and will be e expelled from the center of the system. And it has been not clear for basically a few decades whether this mechanism would be efficient enough to bring to the binary coalescence, but uh, hopefully I will have time later to say something more about this. Uh, in any case, even in the first uh, work by Begelman et al, um, the effect of gas was put forward as a possible way to also help the spiral and bring the binary down to this milliparsec scale at which the, the gravitational waves will ensure the coalescence. Um, however, this uh, simple picture, which has been uh, referenced for many, many years, um, 
today is a bit, little bit shaky just because it's uh, a bit simplistic, even if it is great. And I'm here to tell you why. Uh, in particular, uh, there have been a lot of additional uh, studies uh, in the recent years that uh, started putting forward and suggest a lot of additional uh, effects that uh, point towards basically a much richer and more complex evolution of the binary. Uh, so here I, I mentioned some, and basically uh, throughout my talk, I will try to at least uh, mention or uh, tell you a bit more about these potential uh, additional effects. Um, and, but let's first state why uh, do we need to enrich this uh, initial simple paradigm? The reason is basically that myself as a theorist and many others, so we tend to model galaxies as very nice spherical balls of uh, stars, for instance. But in truth, you know that galaxies are very different than these. They have a lot of different shapes. Uh, and this is especially true if we look at interacting galaxies or uh, irregular galaxies, and even more true if we look at the high redshift universe in which galaxies look very little legs regular. And uh, actually understanding how the pairing of massive black holes proceeds in this situation is critical because the LISA mission, as I told you before, is going to observe massive black hole mergers up to the very high redshift universe. So we really need to understand this. And so now I will start telling you about the large scaling spiral of massive black hole pairs in more realistic systems. Um, and in particular, what uh, I did uh, with my collaborators here is uh, to uh, perform a numerical simulation in which we took a pretty typical main sequence galaxy at redshift uh, close to seven. Uh, this galaxy is a typical galaxy for the redshift. It has a lot of gas. It has a very thick and turbulent disk. Uh, and it comes from a uh, zoom-in cosmological simulation. I don't go into technical details. Uh, I will just go straight to the point. We basically distributed some uh, massive black holes of 10 to the 6 solar masses in this galaxy uh, to understand how much time they would take to reach the primary black hole, which you put here in the overdense uh, region of the galaxy. Uh, and since the, the run is very computationally expensive, we just decided to use a trick in which we evolve six secondary black holes at a time at two different radii on a coplanar circular orbit. And uh, they stay, we check all the time that those black holes stay far apart enough so that each one can be thought to be evolving independently. And uh, here I will show you a little bit of the evolution of the primary and two of those uh, six black holes. And uh, what you, you see is that the, initially the orbits are circular, but they quickly get off the plane. You don't see it, but it's true. And they get more eccentric. Uh, while the galaxy starts developing structures, uh, as you see a bar here, and uh, by the end of the run, run you may have noticed, uh, one of those black holes has made it to the center, to the primary black hole, but the other one was basically ejected outwards. Uh, so let's go a bit more into the quantitative stuff. And here I show you the distance as a function of time of each of those secondary black holes uh, to the primary black hole in the simulation. And the table here shows you for each of those black holes how much time they take to reach the smallest separation we can reach in this simulation. And uh, I want to mention that this black hole had to be taken out from the simulation because of some numerical effects. Um, but the most importantly, with great surprise, we found that uh, even if the black holes were starting from basically the very same initial separation, just with a different phase, they would took a, like a factor of two difference in time scale to reach the central region. And uh, in uh, this other case, uh, what we found is that uh, in these uh, in roughly 150 million years, one black hole basically got ejected from the system, doubling both its initial separation and its initial angular momentum, uh, while other two were 
basically dragged towards the center in the same time. Uh, and this really points towards an erratic evolution. So we asked ourselves, okay, I mean, this is very interesting, but we, we want to know more. What's going on? What's dynamical friction doing here? So in order to understand this better, we decided to estimate the de deceleration that each of those black holes were experiencing due to the fact of dynamical friction via those standard formulas that I'm sure at least some of you are familiar with. Uh, and we computed the uh, dynamical friction deceleration in this semi-analytical fashion. And once we have this, we compute the associated torque that is due to dynamical friction. Uh, and in this red line, you see the torque due to dynamical friction as a function of time for three example black holes in the simulation. It's sort of tiny, let's say. Uh, and now let's go one step further. What I also computed is the total cumulative torque acting on each of those uh, black holes uh, during uh, the uh, simulation due to everything is in fact in the simulation, not only dynamical friction. And is this blue line here. And you can basically see that this is much larger than the dynamical friction induced torque. And this is, I would say, a pretty interesting result. Uh, basically the vast majority of the variations in the angular momentum of the black holes, which basically means the, the in spiral of each black holes, cannot be explained by dynamical friction, but rather by the fact that the galaxy evolves, it has a structures and it forms a, a bar. In fact, here I mark the time of formation of a strong bar in a galaxy. You may have noticed in the previously in the movie. Um, at this time, uh, the global torques uh, uh, shoot up. You see it pretty clearly. And this means that uh, the bar has actually a pretty big role in the orbital evolution. And after the bar formation, uh, the, the evolution gets very prompt. One black hole gets expelled, other two get very quickly dragged to the center. So the key message of this is that uh, the global non-symmetric torques uh, that uh, are present in this irregular galaxy may dominate the spiral instead of dynamical friction. So in order to understand this uh, interesting result, we decided basically uh, to go one step back. And we decided to model the spiral of a, a massive black hole in a, a smooth Milky Way like galaxy, but this time is in a semi analytical orbital integration integrator. Uh, in fact, we uh, we implemented uh, the analytical potentials that make up a galaxy of different galactic components. And we also added a very, very careful treatment of uh, dynamical friction of uh, massive perturbers as massive black holes. Uh, and those have been tested very well against numerical simulations and they work remarkably well. And this integrator in particular has been mainly developed by Matteo Bonetti, who's a collaborator of mine. So if you have more questions on, on the code, uh, I direct you to him. Uh, what we did here, is that uh, we build up a Milky Way like model in this uh, orbital integrator. And uh, we took into account the dark matter halo, the disk, uh, and the budge. And then we built up another almost equal Milky Way model in which part of the mass of the disk and the budge is given to a bar like structure which resembles the bar of the Milky Way. And then what we did is to take those two different configurations, barred and unbarred, and we made several runs in which we count how much uh, massive black hole would take to reach the center of the system if the bar is there and if it is not. So, okay, this is sort of a messy slide, but I, I hope I will guide you through it. Maybe you have this here. Um, so what you are seeing here is uh, like the different in spiral time scale 
as a function of the phase um, that a massive perturber has compared to the bar. The bar is uh, at phase zero, basically. Um, and what you see here is that I made a lot of different runs in which uh, I started from different separations from the center, from four to 12 kiloparsecs, and in which I put the, the massive perturber on either a much more circular or a sort of very radial orbit. And what you see in this plot is that with the points, I show you the time scale, the, this massive perturber needs to reach the center if the bar is there. While if you see this horizontal line, it means that we are referring to the run where no bar is present. Because of course, in that case, the system is axisymmetric and we do not have a dependence on the orbital phase. I forgot to tell you, but it's very important. Uh, we are only evolving for now uh, orbits that are in the plane of the disk and uh, are co-rotating with the bar and with the rotation of the disk, basically. Um, and uh, I put this gray thingy, meaning that up here, the objects would take more than a Hubble time to reach the center. So we basically say they never inspire. Uh, and what you can clearly see in the different cases is that if the bar is present, it can change the decay time scale by a very large factor, a factor like easily a factor of two or a factor of a few. And this is a strong message because it means that even in a simple, uh, smooth galaxy model uh, with the simplest uh, um, prescriptions we put there, uh, even in this situation, a bar can change the spiral time scale by a factor of uh, two. And so this is important to be taken into account when we want to understand the in spiral, not only of massive black holes, but uh, perhaps also globular clusters, uh, stellar clusters, all sorts of things uh, you can have in mind. In general, the effect of the bar is that the evolution gets more stochastic, of course. And also on the same lines, I made a much wider exploration of the parameter space uh, in which we basically changed the uh, uh, several initial orbits of the massive perturbers, the mass of the spiraling object, the inclination with respect to the disk, the orbital phase, and also how much the, the orbit was initially circular versus radial. And uh, in this map, I basically encode uh, how likely it is that the bar promotes the spiral versus it hinds, hinders it. And I was actually surprised uh, to find that if uh, we are uh, evolving in plane coplanar orbits, uh, the bar can well help uh, in uh, making the spiral faster. While as long as uh, we start getting off plane, the bar seems not to be an efficient uh, driver for the uh, in spiral. And also another surprise was that the bar effect, uh, the fact that it tends to keep those, the um, objects uh, far away from the center is more true for a high mass massive black holes. So high mass massive black holes tend to stay farther away from the center. And finally, in uh, here I show you a specific example in which I computed the, the torque uh, induced uh, by the, the bar, basically, uh, on the evolution of a coplanar massive perturber. Uh, this is averaged over a, a complete orbit in order to avoid a lot of oscillations. And also I compare it to the magnitude of the dynamical friction induced torque. And you can see that those two are pretty comparable or even the, the, the bar induced torque is larger uh, for most of the integration, meaning that really this is a remarkable effect. Um, so my take home point about this is that dynamical friction theory is definitely not enough to understand the spiral time scale of massive perturbers. And that the famous dynamical friction time scale that a lot of people love to use, which is a great estimate, if we want to get a little bit more realistic, might be off by 
of a, an important factor. And this is very important if you want to understand that in a realistic galaxy, how often a massive black hole binary may form. Okay, so this was a very big chunk about the large scale evolution of a massive black holes. What about if the binary finally manages to form in the center of the system? What, what happens there? And now I'm going to tell you more about this. I'm sure at least some of you have heard about the infamous final parsec problem. So let's now uh, go into a little detail. Basically, uh, as I told you before, when a bound binary forms in the center of the system at a few parts at scale in a case of a 10 to the 6 solar mass black hole, then it will uh, shrink further and further if we just think about purely stellar environments by the continuous interactions with stars that get close enough to the binary and get ejected, scattered away from the center. However, uh, there is a problem because if those stars get scattered away from the center, at some point, all the stars that were on a low angular momentum orbit that could uh, get close enough to the binary to interact with it will be ejected out. So we need some additional mechanism that could bring a new and new stars close to the center. And this has been, uh, th there were past simulations uh, that uh, used to evolve uh, uh, massive binaries in perfectly spherical systems that seem to suggest that the binary, in fact, uh, would stall at roughly a parsec scale and never further shrink. Basically because the only thing that was thought to be able to repopulate the region about the binary was two body relaxation, but its time scale is definitely too long for it to be efficient. So people started thinking, okay, uh, it's weird because when we look at uh, massive black holes in the close by galaxies, so they look like single objects. Uh, it seems like they are not in a binary. So What's this? Why do we see that, that the binary will never merge? And so people start, started trying to resolve this famous final parsec problem. And there has been a, really a plethora of uh, solutions that have been put forward. And here I'm trying to mention a few, what I think are maybe the, the, the most relevant ones, but apologies if maybe I forget something which is important. And uh, one possibility, of course, is that uh, if the binary is stalling for a long time, then the host galaxy could undergo a further merger in which a further black hole is dragged uh, into the merger remnant and it will spiral again towards the center. And so uh, a third a system of, uh, made up of three black holes will form. And in this situation, it has been shown that basically uh, the binary interaction can be much quicker. Either the third black hole managed to excite the eccentricity uh, of the inner binary so that the gravitational wave time scale gets very small and the binary merges promptly, or otherwise uh, this, this the third black hole can get very close, a chaotic interaction may occur in which one of the three gets ejected out like starts before, and uh, the two remaining black holes will have uh, lost a lot of energy and will probably get into the gravitational wave in spiral phase. Another possibility, uh, which I myself also explored with my collaborators, uh, is the possibility that uh, in our galaxy, there would be stellar clusters. Stellar clusters that if are massive enough and for close enough to the center, may in spiral, in spiral towards the center and finally meet the binary. So the binary would have a brand new reservoir of stars to interact with and will shrink further during uh, the, the expulsion and the disruption basically of the stellar cluster. And this is uh, especially efficient if we have uh, several clusters the energy to inspire towards the binary on a relatively radial orbit. Another thing that actually was put forward since the beginning 
was the so-called binary Brownian motion. Uh, to understand this better, what is it? Uh, we can think of a massive black hole, or in this case of the massive binary, in principle to be basically sitting stably at the bottom of the potential well of the galaxy. But this is not true, because in fact, uh, the, the center of mass of the binary will suffer random tugs from the fact that the surrounding environment is not perfectly homogeneous. Stars uh, are granular, so they will give little kicks to the binary that will oscillate about the, the, um, the bottom of the potential well of the galaxy. And if this oscillation is wide enough, then the binary may encounter new stars to interact with it while it oscillates, and it will shrink, uh, shrink further. Actually, uh, in uh, a paper we have done in 2016, we have shown that this effect is in fact not working really if we think about stars uh, in uh, standard galaxies hosting black holes that are typically above 10 to the 3 solar masses. Uh, so this effect, uh, if we rely on stars alone, is definitely not enough. But what I, I am just uh, telling you in my personal opinion, and I think it would work, is that if you have some more massive object like a giant molecular cloud or another massive perturber that managed to fly close to the binary with a mass that is one tenth or one hundredth of the mass of the binary, then those oscillations, uh, I assume, could uh, do some job. Uh, and this brings me to the very, let's say, ultimate solution to the final parsec problem. What, what is uh, basically uh, assumed now to be the, the, the definite and most general solution which is the triaxiality of the system. So to put it short, the fact that again, we were before simplifying too much. So what's the story here? Basically, when we have a perfectly spherical system, uh, stars are um, forced to move on centrophilic Rosetta orbits, and they have to conserve the components of their angular momentum. What does this mean? This means that once all stars on an angular momentum orbit low enough to interact with the binary are ejected, there is no way to get new stars close to the binary. And this would bring to the binary stalling. But we are talking about spherically symmetric systems. Uh, if we start to like a, model the galaxy in a more realistic way so that it doesn't look like a perfect sphere but more like a flattened uh, more triaxial then what has been shown uh, also in a work that uh, i was uh, happy to be part of is that uh, the, the the stars basically do not have to conserve the components of their angular momentum because the large scale gravitational torques that are triggered because of the non-sphericity of the galaxy, basically funnel stars again and again towards the center. This means that a star that may have spent a lot of time far away from the center, it, it may at some point get a, a, a torque that is in the right direction to get deflected towards the center. And so center filling orbits are uh, a lot in triaxial systems, and it has been shown that those uh, uh, deviations from sphericity basically ensure that the binary continues shrinking because new and new stars get close to it. So this is to say that the, sorry, the final parsec problem is solved. And this is a good news because uh, I, I'm sure you know, we don't really know of any galaxy which is perfectly spherically symmetric, they all deviate from sphericity. Uh, so it means that basically binaries can merge efficiently due to stellar interactions. Um, and uh, in another study that I performed during my PhD is basically to try to understand really what is the effect of this non-sphericity. 
So what I did is that I performed a series of numerical simulations in which I varied the, uh, the impact parameter over which two galaxies hosting two massive black holes would merge. And I basically tracked the shape of the final galaxy merger remnant, how much it would deviate from uh, sphericity, if it would be more like a disk or more like a ballet, a prolate. And then I computed how much time a binary would take to shrink, uh, how fast it would shrink in those different, uh, sh differently shaped galaxy models. And what I found is that uh, basically, regardless of how much this galaxy deviates from spherical symmetry, uh, what really determines the, the, the speed at which the binary shrinks is simply the density of stars in the central region. And this is a very good news because it basically means that as long as we have a galaxy that deviates a little bit from perfect sphericity and even perfect axis symmetry, then uh, that is enough. And the only parameter we, we need really to care about to understand how quick the, the binary evolution is, is the density close to the center. And of course, also the velocity dispersion, but some parameters that are perhaps much easier to characterize than the, the whole shape of a galaxy, right? Uh, so this was one thing and like, so far, I basically neglected to mention, I didn't mention the interactions with gas at the small scale. This is basically because I don't work on it, but I thought maybe it would be good to have a little mention of it um, anyways for completeness. And uh, what I want to tell you now is that even if in the beginning and for years actually, the effects of gas, so for instance, the torques induced by gas structures around a binary system and uh, accretion and the torques uh, were initially thought to help the binary shrink further and further quite efficiently. But uh, due to the increase, the resolution of simulations, now, nowadays, the simulation is much less clear. And it is very still very much debated whether gas can help or not the binary shrinking and uh, the, the reason for this is basically that still we are lacking resolution in and body simulations uh, and in fact some simulations seem to say that uh, the binary is uh, helped in its shrinking via gas interactions while some other simulations seem to uh, find that instead the binary it enhances its separation due to effect of, uh, of gas, which is a surprising result, of course. Um, and then to conclude this little part, I just want to mention uh, that so far, uh, to my knowledge, there is no work that uh, really combines the uh, effect of gas on the binary evolution with the effect of stars. Of course, because it's very difficult. It's even very difficult just to tackle stars, uh, gas alone, sorry. Uh, but in a, a, a work we have uh, recently published, uh, basically we found that uh, by having uh, this uh, subparsec resolution in evolving a binary embedded in a disk, we found that the gas-induced torques were basically of little or no help in ensuring the binary shrinking. But via a semi-analytical calculations that we performed, we found out that instead, if we rely on the number of stars that likely inhabit this galaxy, those would be enough to ensure coalescence. Meaning that even if probably, I mean, it's not clear if gas helps or not, maybe stars can be the, the definite answer to the binary uh, final coalescence. And so I'm, to, I, I got to my last slide. I will give you a little summary on the evolution of massive black hole binaries. So what we have seen is that the evolution of massive black hole binaries uh, in realistic environments, especially those at high redshift or in non-regular galaxies, can be very, very stochastic. And in particular, the largest scale torques that uh, are present in realistic galaxies can be 
way more efficient than dynamical friction in driving the evolution of massive black holes. Uh, and this is true even in a bark galaxy like the Milky Way, in which torques already are very important. Uh, and then going to the small scale, uh, I want to really stress that uh, the, the famous final parsec problem for binary evolution in stellar environments is, has now been solved. Uh, and there are several effects that have been put forward, but in particular, the fact that uh, all galaxies are triassial seem to be the, the key solution to ensure the fact new and new stars are dragged to the binary and ensure it's uh, uh, the fact that it will enter in the gravitational wave emission stage. Um, finally, uh, I, I showed you that uh, even, even if the, the non sphericity of the galaxy is important, what really determines the, the speed at which a binary shrinks is the central density of the host galaxy. And uh, I mentioned also that the effect of gas is still really much to be investigated, especially in combination of stars, which, by the way, seem to, in general, be able in most situations to ensure a binary shrinking. Okay, so I think I, I finished my presentation, and uh, I thank you very much, all of you, uh, for listening, and I'm ready to take questions. Thank you, Lisa, for the very information-packed seminar. <laughs> <laughs> a, lot, a lot of material you covered. So if there are any questions, you can raise your hand. And uh, uh, Federico, who's, the, who's actually uh, managing the Zoom meeting, will give you, I mean, will unmute you. But of course, you can even write a question in the chat. And I will read it if you prefer to go that direction. So right now, there is, yes, there is a, a raised hand. Can you unmute the person, Federica? Uh, Antonio yeah. Stamera. Yep, okay. yep, go ahead. Hi, Charlie. And thanks for uh, the contribution, really interesting. Well, Mike's very general question. Uh, uh, according to, to what you found, which is very interesting, the possibility to solve uh, the, 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 this problem in, in a quality sense of supermassive binary black holes. I mean, do you have any feeling if this can also have a role in uh, producing a massive uh, black holes uh, in the very first uh, uh, cosmological evolution, which is the usual problem in uh, in, uh, in, in creating uh, massive uh, black holes in the very early early stage of the uh, of the structure formation in the, uh, at the redshift uh, eight or something seven up to reionization. Okay. Yes. So uh, uh, I would say that um, if I got your question correctly, uh, the, the problem there would be that uh, those objects would likely experience a weak dynamical friction due to, to the fact that galaxies are small and those, those black holes are likely much uh, less massive than today. Um, so what I can tell you is that uh, at least for the formation of the binary, uh, then we can in principle rely on large scale torques because what I showed you before is that it seems dynamical friction is not the key driver in the in spiral of those massive black holes. So if there is another mechanism like the formation of a bar in a proto galaxy, or I don't know, some scatterings with some uh, substructures that actually manage to, to change a lot of the angular momentum of objects that are flying around, this can be in principle an efficient mechanism that could be much more efficient than dynamical friction in ensuring that a binary black hole would form even at a that high redshift. Of course, this effect of torques is stochastic, meaning that I showed you uh, in some cases the, the, the two black holes are dragged towards the center. Sometimes one of them can be kicked out. But uh, if we do the statistics, I would say, this is my personal feeling, we would form at least some binaries, even in the very high redshift universe. 
um, concerning the very like a much smaller scale evolution, I am afraid uh, I don't really have an idea because those objects at uh, like a sub sub parsec scale are probably in the high redshift universe dominated by gas. And so there is all the, the let's say, the uh, uh, de debate that's still going on about the effect of gas. So this really, I don't have a feeling. I hope I answered your question. Uh, yes, approximately, yes, I would say. And maybe if I, if I may, a second one, uh, yeah. and then I stop. Uh, if, if you have also have an idea, uh, you, you, you are using, let's say, a very uh, small, this bar, uh, um, uh, the possibility that bars also in, in induce uh, a formation or, and coalescence of binary supermassive black holes. But do you have also a feeling again here if there is there could be any difference between, for example, normal standard galaxies and active galaxies AGNs? Uh, okay, so uh, I have to make clear in the initial simulation, cosmological zoom in simulation, I showed you we switched off the accretion of the black holes. Uh, what is my feeling? is that if we do switch on the accretion on the black holes, uh, those black holes would start uh, to basically carve out bubbles around them uh, to eject material. So a dynamical friction might be even less efficient just because the, those black holes may just, you know, push away material that is close. And so in that situation, my very personal feeling, which has never been tested to my knowledge, is that uh, dynamical friction might be even less efficient. In fact, there are some works that are at smaller scale, uh, I think from Del Valle, uh, who uh, state that uh, dynamical friction can be positive, meaning that instead of uh, shrinking the objects, it enlarges them once uh, basically accretion on those black holes is switched on. Uh, I'm not sure this will help, but my feeling is that accretion would even enhance the stochasticity. Okay, thanks, thanks. Any other questions or comments for Elisa? No. If not, well, let's give it 30 more seconds, but if no one raises their hands, I think we can reach the end of the seminar. I don't see any raised questions, any raised hands for now. So I'm gonna thank our speaker thank you. Uh, for her very informative seminar. And I'm gonna thank all of you for participating. I hope to see you again in a month. Uh, it's going to be the second um, Thursday of March. We will have the second speaker for the Laura Bassi series. You can find all the information on our website. And pretty soon we'll update also. I mean, there are the names of all the speakers for the series for this year. But we will update also with the titles and abstracts. Um, and I hope to see you then. Thank you so very much, Elisa. And thanks Thank all you, of you for Sarah. participating. Have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.